Hey, welcome to the Push Pull Sales and Marketing Podcast. I'm Marcello. And I'm Sherry. And each episode will provide you with sales and marketing strategies that you can implement immediately into your own business. In this episode, Marcello talks with Kurt Mortensen. Um, he is a podcaster himself, he's a best selling author, he has um, Influence University, and he talks a lot about persuasion and how that relates to sales. Um, he helps companies, he's a consultant. Um, there's not much he doesn't do in that realm, I think. He has a lot of years of experience under his belt, and it was really interesting to hear them talk about some things, and especially Marcello as a sales guy, um, being able to approach things from that perspective, questions that I wouldn't necessarily have thought to ask. So um, listen on, and as usual, we'll link you to all of Kurt's links in the show notes at pushpullsales.com. Enjoy. Okay, everybody, I have Kurt Mortensen, and his podcast is, I believe, Kurt, is it Maximize Your Influence? It is. Awesome. His website is MaximizeYourInfluence.com. Uh, we have another uh, special guest uh, interview today. So first off, Kurt, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? You bet. I uh, grew up in California. You know, love life. My big thing is uh, family. We love to uh, wakeboard, go to the mountains, but... My main focus in life has been teaching people how to persuade and influence because I was mad I didn't learn it in school. Cool, cool. And so so in California, you, you grew up over there. When did you decide, hey, I want to jump in, I want to do influence, I want to do sales and persuasion? And, and when, did, when did you have that moment where you said, this is what I want to do? Well, it was after you spent all this money for a college degree, and I actually worked on a graduate degree in business, and you get thrust in the workforce – and I realized I didn't learn some of the basic skills about human nature, about influence, about persuasion. And then I heard that most CEOs have a sales and a marketing background. I'm like, wait a minute. And it was just an eye opener to me that it's all about influence and persuasion, that that's a key success skill. And it was mostly because I needed it for me personally. And then I was also a little mad that, wow, all this education and I had next to nothing in understanding people and influence and some of the key factors that you need for success. Very good, very good, and we are gonna we are gonna go into it a little bit later in terms of getting some some sort of every time we have an interview like this, we definitely would like to get a nugget of uh, a nugget of, of information, something valuable for our uh, for our listeners here. So you not only have a, a podcast, so it, so for what you're doing right now, this is pretty much this is pretty much your full time business, correct? It is. I do podcasting. I, I'm an author. I'm a trainer. I'm a consultant, and just passionate about teaching people the skills to be more influential and. And to basically get others to want to do what you want them to do and like doing it. Gotcha. Now, is that is that more so from a face-to-face -face interaction, what you're actually doing, or you're doing it from a marketing standpoint and how to influence people in terms of the language, in terms of the product positioning, or is it a little bit of both? How exactly is that structured? Yeah, I would say yes, all the above. I mean, there's a lot of different <laughs> factors, right? With influence, you just can't focus on one. Too many people focus on the logic or the data dumper, which I call the vomit, right? Here are the 42 reasons and that's not persuasive. And so it's a balance of logic and motion, understanding human nature and bringing all those things together. That's where you really become very successful in sales and marketing. Gotcha. Now I, I like to, I like to make this joke all the time. So you said, you said you're married and you have kids. How many kids do you have? Four kids. Four kids. I like to think I am, I'm very, I'm very, very persuasive except in mm -hmm. terms of where we live and except when it comes to the missus. So Sherry, she, she is my other half, and uh, she is the one who, who normally uh, – the only person who I can't influence. Uh, in, in your life, are you in a similar situation or – As far as a spouse? <laughs> yeah. Are, in, in, all, yeah. In, all, in all your studies and all that, does it work on the spouse? <laughs> well, there are certain things that work, but then my spouse is pretty savvy on – on persuasion and influence, she's like, wait a minute, that's not going to work on me. And, and they know you so well, too. They can kind of see through some of the, the techniques and <laughs> how that works out. So, yeah, I guess there's some challenges there when you live with a person and they know you so well. Gotcha. Now, now is your is your wife, is she, is she in the business as well? She is. She's uh, helped me with a lot of the books and the research that I've done. And, 
And it's interesting, and in fact, for those in sales can appreciate this, she knows so many of the sales techniques that when someone tries to persuade her or sell her, she'll actually say, you know, I'm not going to buy for you, and let me tell you why. <laughs> and you might smile about that, but that's actually pretty refreshing for a lot of people, for from someone to sit down with them and say, you know what, let me tell you why you weren't persuasive, why I didn't like you, why I didn't trust you. And people actually appreciate actually appreciate when she does it. Hmm. So so flat out she tells them? She yeah, promised? she does. And again, it's shocking to people because everyone else lies. Oh, I'll think about it. I'll come back later, right? <laughs> Too <laughs> no, expensive. No. Those are all everyone calls back. Come on now. Sixty seven percent of the time that's a lie. But she's like, No, let me tell you why I'm not gonna buy. You did this wrong and this wrong, you should trust this, you tried this, you vomited on me, you didn't give any benefits, you did this. And again, it takes people back at first because they're not used to it, but then actually that's going to save them a lot of money in the future because it's very rare for someone to really tell you the truth, especially at the end of a sales presentation. I do that, and Sherry says I'm mean. It's, it's, it's kind of funny because <laughs> I've – and for most people, and, and we talked about we talked about this in other podcasts, I love to have a sales interaction, to have a salesperson something like that. Like if there's – you know, one of those like, oh, you get, it. you can have a free sample, but we're going to send a sales rep over or something like that. Or for, I think it was for like a food delivery thing or something along those. Yeah, it was, it was for food delivery. And I'm like, you're going to send a sales rep? I was so excited. I get to like evaluate and I have that whole entire like, oh. And I, and I was I was very honest with her too. Like she's like, you don't like it. You don't like it. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not it's not the idea I don't like. It's, it's your actual presentation. And again, I went through some of the things. I'm like, one – some of the assumptions that that, I, that that you were saying about cost and stuff like that, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, two, you just you just badmouth the rest of the industry and you didn't provide any sort of facts and data, so I don't necessarily believe you. Everything, it, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to believe you. You were late. You sent and that it was, it was a very awkward interaction. It was very. It was. But it they was, need to hear that. No one's telling them that. In fact, I have a sign in my office. Outside my office, please solicit. Come in. Try to sell me. I want to hear you because one of the things I do is monitor sales presentation, but I want someone to come in and try to persuade me. And, in fact, if they're coming to my office, going door to door, and they're good, I want to hire them because that takes some guts, and they've got to be good to do what they do to survive in that business. Oh, I, I did that. I did that. Someone called me from uh, from Rutgers uh, trying to sell me. I want to try. Yeah, they, they were trying to get they were trying to get a donation from me. Mm-hmm. And I've gotten many calls from the university trying to get me to donate something, and I, and, I, and I'll donate directly to the wrestling team. But she was really good, and I'm like, I'm like, well, what are? I'm like, are you, are you junior or senior? She's like, oh, I'm a junior. I was like, when you graduate, here's my email. I'm like, send me your resume, seriously. Give me a call, and it's refreshing as salespeople to be sold in the right way. It's a great thing. That's why they say salespeople are the easiest to close because, right? We we appreciate good techniques. Absolutely, absolutely. So how long have you been uh, – so the name of this is actually – it's also called Maximize Your Influence? That's the podcast, yeah. Okay, so that's the podcast. And what's the name of your actual business? Oh, Advanced Influence. Advanced Influence. Okay, so how long have you had Advanced Influence? Oh, 20 years. 20 years, okay. 20 years going deep into the world of the art and science of persuasion, influence, and sales. It's just so fascinating to me to understand why people do what they do. Okay. And we were talking about this a little bit before. So you've had the podcast now. You're almost going on finishing up three years. You're going to be on four years now, correct? Yeah, we're getting there. Awesome, awesome. So when when you run into someone and you say, hey, okay, this is what I do. We, I do advanced influence. I have, I have a podcast. I'm also an author. And how many books have you written? Four books. Four books in what time span? Oh, probably the last 12 years. Okay, in 12 uh, years. That's about, Okay. And your books, that's available on your website. Can I, can I see them on Amazon? They're on Amazon website. It's uh, Maximum Influence, Persuasion IQ, Laws of Charisma. Okay. Are all available. Yeah. Okay. Better bookstores everywhere. Isn't that what you're supposed to say? <laughs> <laughs> bookstore? What's that? Come on. <laughs> I know. Exactly. They're no longer bookstores. It's, <laughs> it doesn't work out that well anymore. But it's all digital, online. There's audios available. So it takes a deep dive into the world of influence and persuasion. Very cool. So we're gonna have links to all those books. Well, we also have links to uh, we'll also have links to your website. So you run into someone and they say, okay, so so what exactly do you do? And then and then you kind of go into it and you say, okay, well, I, I like to help people in terms of influence. I'm I'm obsessed with that. What are what are some common questions you hear af- after that? What are you hearing from people? Uh, a lot of them are frustrated, wondering what's taken so long to be successful. Because I mean, you can take. 
two people of equal talent, equal IQ, the same leads, one's super successful and one's not, you know, and one's, and what does that person have that the other person doesn't have? And the reason I'm passionate about it is, A, I didn't learn it. Uh, B, there's a lot of offensive skills out there. I mean, we talk about closing skills quite a bit of the time, and that's what people want to know. Well, give me more closing skills. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. Closing skills is like trying to get a kiss after a bad date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. If, if someone doesn't like you and trust you, if there's no need for your product or service, it doesn't matter what clever phrase you have. Now, there's a time and place for a closing skill. But the challenge is that's all people want to learn, closing skill, closing skill. But what about your presentation? What about the intro? What about under getting that the rapport, the trust? And here's fascinating research that I've done is that when people like you and trust you, you have an 88% chance of influence. Okay. And it can be that simple. And people think, well, people like me and people trust me. I'm like, no, they don't. In fact, in seminars, I'll ask this question will say, you know that annoying person nobody likes? You know that person that rubs you the wrong way? You know that person that thinks they're funny but they're not? And everyone's like, yeah, we know that person. And then I'll say, well, that could be you. No, <laughs> no. And they're like, no. I'm like, yes, you don't know. You can get along with people like you, but the challenge is this. Most people's default setting is that they persuade people how they like to be persuaded. They sell people how they like to be sold, and that's wrong. We need to adapt to the person and persuade them how they want to be persuaded and that's their big question they want to know well, why is this only working x percent of the time is well you're doing the same thing over and over and you have to adapt you have to adjust you have to help people persuade themselves because the moment somebody senses you're going to try to sell them sell them something even though they need it want it like it can afford it they're going to resist you so you need to help them sell themselves help them persuade themselves and that changes everything and that makes a huge difference absolutely now, now let me ask you, and I'm and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna guess here, and I think you're the same way. Do you go into into the actual different learning types? You have visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. You, sure. Okay. Yeah. And and you're probably auditory, correct? I am yeah. mostly auditory. Okay, very good. And and it's kind of funny too. And you mentioned that, and 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 I'm gonna and I sometimes I get flack over this when we talk about people who are kinesthetic learners. Mm-hmm. I call them weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> And because it's not really what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm used to in terms of their mannerisms and things that they say and how they pause and stuff like that, I'm not really used to that. And, and sometimes, you know, if I'm not aware that I do get frustrated trying to sell to those kind of people because oh, sure. I have to change up how much I do. Because when I'm, when I'm normally selling and, and all that, I like, I like to hear my own voice. So I ask a lot of questions about the customer. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just, I just want the customer to talk. And when people – don't really say a lot and they're not giving a lot of feedback without necessarily having that actual hands-on or maybe changing up the presentation or maybe doing something a little bit more creative um you know i used to get really really frustrated with them like what what is going on and i'd say that that's probably and i would like to ask you some questions about that um how to get over you know some people where you're not getting as much feedback or maybe where you're not really matching up style so i'm gonna, I'm gonna ask some questions about that in a little bit so you have the business advanced influence. What what would you say sets apart your business? Because and 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 people have asked me too. You know, if you were to say business consultant, management consultant, if you were to say the whatever comes off the top of your head, the first thing that normally comes to my head when I hear management consultant is those who can't do <laughs> teach, and those oh, yeah. who can't teach are management consultants or also gym teachers. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, there's I'm a kidding. lot of truth to that. There's a lot of consultants that have given the the, uh, the industry a bad name. Uh, you know, when you look at that, it's uh, true. I mean, I think that's true most of the time to where people are out there teaching some things they shouldn't be teaching. They are not up to speed. In fact, that's one of the reasons I, I'm in this world. I was teaching a university course on public speaking, really? and they asked me to teach a course on rhetorical methods. I'm like, what's that? Is that rhetorical methods, ethos, pathos, logos? Like, I looked at the book. I'm like, this is a sales course. He's like, no, it's not sales. <laughs> I'm offended. University, we don't teach sales. I'm like, this is sales. No, it's not sales. I'm like, all right, I'll teach you rhetorical methods. But it was a sales class. But the reason I was so passionate about it is I was, as I looked at their different models and theories, I had been in sales long enough to know that wouldn't work. That's not real. That's pretty but would not work. And so you're right on. A lot of the things that they're teaching out there do don't work, have never worked, or don't work anymore. Hmm. 
and 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 it's called rhetoric. The name of the course was rhetorical. It was methods. rhetorical methods. It was just a fancy name for a persuasion sales course, but it was under it what major? Under sales. what major? It was under communications. Communications. Okay. Yeah, and I said, you know, in fact, I've been passionate about teaching university. You got to teach these courses. What are they going to use in the world? World? How to present yourself? How to be influential? How to sell? I think Harvard's finally added some sales courses to their MBA programs because we all sell for a living. You know that, right? Absolutely. We all sell for a living, and that's the biggest challenge. And and that's what I've been passionate about is that most people only really have four to five sales tools. Mm-hmm. And I've identified over 100. 100. Because you know, Abraham Maslow says if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, you treat everyone like a nail. You've got to get more tools. I like that. I like that. That's cool. And, and, and it's interesting how you talk about from, from an actual communications major and an actual course because when I, when I got into sales and I, I have a degree in philosophy and political science, one of the things I thought about in terms of selling and, and this is really because I came from – it was a one-call close environment. You know, you're trying to sell people um, you know, a very, very high, high-dollar product and I thought, boom, Socratic method. I'm just going to go through the questions I'm gonna, and I'm just going to run through and I'm going to pin them down. And you, and you go through the actual logic. Sometimes that will work. Some, sometimes it didn't. But I like to transfer. And, and, and that's part of the reason why I actually like sales. I'm like, oh, something from college I can actually use. Because right now I don't use much of my major at all. I hate to, I hate to say it. A lot, of, a lot of what I learned is from reaching out to people like you, uh, reading books, going to seminars, listening to tapes. Um, having 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 all those resources available and using that, I probably learned more that's actually applicable outside. Um, so one thing I did want to ask you: How often do you run into people and they're not really willing to invest in a service like yours or to have a consultant come in? And how much of that do you have to actually go and persuade them? How much of that is people actually coming on board to you only because of your marketing, only because of reaching word of mouth? Uh, that's a great question. It's easy when there's word of mouth and you know, someone's seen me before, that type of presentation. And it's also much easier when someone's on a commission, straight commission. They know there's a direct correlation between their income and their personal development. The hardest market for me are, you know, people that are on straight salary. They're, they, you know, they're a manager. They know they need to learn a few things, but they're not really motivated. There's not a direct correlation between their personal development and the income. That's the hardest market for me to tap into and realize that, hey, this is a big difference. And so a lot of times with that type of market, I have to come in and prove my worth, and they realize the benefit to it. But that's a, that's a tough market for any type of personal development or training is the people that, oh, yeah, we have a trainer, and they have to go to their monthly training. That's not the type of audience I like. I love hungry, commissioned people, uh, entrepreneurs, salespeople that know the more I learn, the more I make. And you said before, I think you were over you were over in Bologna. So for your business, how much of that? And we were talking about this a, a little bit before uh, offline. How much of your business is just domestic here within the U.S.? How much of that are you reaching out to people overseas, or are I'd they say, reaching out to you? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd say sixty percent U.S., forty percent international. Okay. Do you find persuasion or do you find how you present or, or what sort of materials or, or tools varies from culture to culture? A little bit. I've identified what I call 12 laws of persuasion, but I've noticed as I've been to the do a lot over in the Middle East, I've done a lot in Asia, South America, uh, around the world, is that it's the same potatoes, you just have to change the gravy, right? It's the same, <laughs> it's the same pasta, you just have to change the sauce. It works. And, and that's the key. Even in your presentation style, I mean, a lot of it's the same. Most people, they want to laugh. They want to have fun. They want to be entertained. They want to learn. But, you know, some cultures, you got to watch what you say. Some jokes I have to fine-tune. What I say in Italy uh, works well. It might not work over in uh, Dubai <laughs> or Qatar, Qatar you know, those type of places. But for the most part, these everything works. You just have to adjust a few things here and there. Okay. And for your for your ideal – um, customer, how much or, or not? Not going to say customer, or client. How much time did you spend, kind of identifying like, okay, I do really well in the you know 500 employees or up, or I do really well with businesses that have an intangible product. How much time do you spend, maybe? Because in, in terms of sales, I like and and and, and I do this, I do this with my sales team all the time. It's always I always say like two things, and then like she's like, well, you, you said two things before. I'm like, all right, well, fine. Where, in terms of where you're going to play and how you're going to win. 
how much of your time do you help salespeople in terms of that too and maybe say you should focus on this market here and how much of that is, is about strategy? Are you almost 90% strategy for what you do for your own business? Uh, majority is strategy. I mean, that's a big part of it as far as getting in there and, and teaching the skills that people need to learn. But, yeah, I'd, I'd say that the biggest part is strategy. Okay. And if you were to reach out to someone for the first time or if you were to enter or if you were to you – know, let's go ahead. If you are training someone, what would be your recommendation in terms of how much of that to keep – formal and light how much time to spend on building rapport i mean have you have you done some of the some of the ratios on that in terms of what sort of demeanor is going to be more effective yeah that's going to depend on personality obviously and, and that's a big complaint as i interview people after someone's tried to sell them is getting too friendly too fast or mm -hmm. the person that goes in hey tell me about the trophy tell me about the golf clubs and they're taking the golf they're tired of talking about those things and so a lot of those things have changed but you still need to really get in and prove your worth. I think a big shift there is uh, as you look at percents. I mean, you want to spend the first 10, 20 percent of time getting to know and building rapport and building trust. But that doesn't have to be the first thing. Mm -hmm. One thing that's kind of shifted is that they need to know that you're the expert. You need to teach them something up front at the beginning in the, at first 10 or 20 percent of the time so they know that you're an expert, that they're intrigued, that there's something a little bit different with what you're going to share with them. So so in your model, you change it up a little bit. So in terms of the old sales model, you have established rapport first thing. You're saying in the beginning, or even maybe simultaneous while you're actually establishing the rapport, you're going to want to build credibility up front, when, and that might be providing some sort of value, some sort of resource. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Now, you have the personality the, that want to talk about the weather and their family. If they start that way, you want to continue with that. Mm -hmm. But if you sit down and you're not getting that interaction – You've got to prove your credibility, prove your worth up front. You're the expert because once you're the expert and you've taught them something and there's something unique about them, something that you need, the doors of persuasion swing wide open. They want to hear because when you're the expert, there's very little resistance, and you've got to get that up front. And then you can start building the rapport, but you've got to prove your worth. There has to be a reason to listen to you in that first part of your presentation or they're going to tune out or, or tell you to go. Okay. So when, when, when you're dealing with when you're dealing with other businesses, how often are are they at to, are they at the point normally where they're looking at you and another and another possible resource? Or at this point, it's pretty much I'm 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 gonna go I'm gonna go with Kurt. I believe in his company. I believe in what he's doing. I just need to do something, and and, and this is and this is the way to do it. Or how often are people quote unquote shopping or, or, or getting the three bids or looking at a couple of different options for you personally? Yeah, I'd say 50-50. I mean, if they've read the book and they're contacting me, it's it's pretty much a done deal as long as I don't blow it or say something dumb, right? They, I've already proved my worth, my expertise, because they've read about me, they've read my research, and then the other half, they might uh, just be contacting me for a bid. They, you know, I was on a list of people that could be teaching influence, and so I'd say it's probably about 50-50. Okay. okay. And what would you say in terms of maybe clients or maybe terms of, or in terms of project or maybe when you were just starting off? Can you, give, can you give an example of one of your best success stories or what would you say you're actually most proud of in terms of your career? Oh, most proud of – I think working with uh, working some, with some high-end, high-tech companies, telecom companies that were struggling with their lead generation, that were struggling with their close rates. And I was able to come in and, and triple their close rates because – they weren't. They were using a lot of old school techniques with the marketing and the way they were interviewing people, and it just wasn't working out for them. So I was able to turn the model around, turn it. I mean, in fact, the first thing I did was a simple thing that a lot of companies make the mistake to where people call up and the receptionist will say, "Hey, well, let me let me transfer you to sales," and that causes instant resistance. Nobody should ever do that. And so we changed it to consultants, which empowered the salespeople. They are now consultants, and it reduced resistance. And so right out front, I worked on their mindset because, as you know, we all know that mindset, the way you think, is almost the most important thing in success and persuasion. We worked on the mindset. We worked on the skills. We walked people through a new model of influence, and it made a huge difference in their ability to sell people what they wanted. Awesome. So – now, and that and that's pretty interesting because if you read a lot of the sales books and a lot of the sales material and going through stuff, a lot of the examples are for telecom companies. Is that is that something where where you still have a client base in in that regard? Because I, I I've never I've never and I don't think my company has ever gotten a call from a quote unquote 
telecom company or someone trying to sell those services. Well, there, yeah, there are a lot out there. A lot of the books do talk about telecom. I think that's just a space where people uh, kind of cut their teeth. And, and the challenge with telecom is that you have so many options, right? That's going to be your challenge. How do you cut through the clutter? You have five options. They seem similar. How do you rise above the pack? And so it's always a good example to use to where a lot of people think, well, telecom's telecom. I can go with the cheapest. But as we all know, cheapest isn't always the best. Oh, absolutely. And you mentioned in the beginning, too, how they interview their salespeople. So you also you also will consult with them and kind of go through some, some sort of uh, archetype on who is going to be a good salesperson? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. How much – and I always kick this around – how much is a salesperson is basically he's just made and he has the right personality set and how much of that is teachable? Oh, that's a great question. Salespeople born, they made, it's, and it's a combination of both. And that's the thing I'm looking for is I want to make sure they're teachable. I could teach anybody to sell. I mean, that's, I mean, some people have inherent skills that make it easier, and that's one of my questions. I'm like, well, tell me the last book you read for personal development. That tells me everything I need to know for the most part. If they're reading and listening to audios or the books and they're in personal development, that teaches me they know they need to learn things. And that's a huge question. And then the way they ask questions, the way they, they talk to me. And in fact, here's an interesting thing when you talk about salespeople now, it's a big shift in the world of persuasion is introverts are now more persuasive than extroverts. Right? And that's a big shift because extroverts come across as salespeople. They create a lot of resistance versus introverts come across as consultant. They listen. They ask more questions. And we all know the more you listen, the more questions you ask, they're going to tell you everything you need to know to persuade them, to sell them. And a lot of people just don't figure that out until it's too late. Hmm. And when do you think when do you think that when do you think that that switch actually happened? When did it switch from an extrovert? Because if you go in terms of the old model and and what used to work, I mean, you had people with gadgets, you know, and they just would just hook in attention real quick and then they just would go into the pitch and most of it was spent on, okay, do you have money? And a lot of that was, it was very much, a, it was very much a, an actual, uh, I, I, I guess you're going to say push. Yeah, it was definitely, it was big, it was big in terms of push. When did that change? How did, how did that happen? I think that transition started about 10 years ago. I mean, we have a lot of factors as far as trust is in an all time low. With, and that's a big issue. People have access to more information now with the Internet. 20 years ago, if you went to buy a car, you had to believe the person. Now you can find anything you want about your company, your product or service, which could be very positive and or very negative. And according to Advertising Age magazine, we're bombarded with over 5,000 persuasive messages a day. You put all those factors together and trust being at all-time low, that really changes the playing field for a lot of people. And so now – the introvert, the consultant, I'm the expert, I'm here to serve you, uh, the consultative type selling has made a big shift. And, you know, people are still using the old skills a little bit here and there. It works every once in a while. But this new style is coming out making a big difference in those who are out there selling in the right way. Gotcha. Yeah, and I remember there, there's – I think it's a Franklin Covey, like, either book or it's uh, some sort of resource. And it was called The Modern uh, Gladiator. And it talked about exactly that. So if you looked at like 100 years ago, someone might get 80 new pieces of advertising or 80 new pieces of information, I think a month. And now we get 5,000 a day. Mm-hmm. To cut through that, you have to be good. You have to know exactly exactly what you're doing. So I do want to transition into that and kind of ask you. So, again, I, I know we can't cover everything, and you're not going to give away all the good stuff for – you're not going to give away all the good stuff for free. I give my wife a very hard time about that when she was when she was designing a course and she was doing um, periscopes and she was doing live streams and she just was giving away all the time. I'm like, why are you giving away the good stuff for free? What are you doing? Because she had spent exactly exactly what you're doing. She had spent years finding what works in terms of uh, either getting published or, or, or resources in terms of getting um, in terms of getting commissions through affiliate marketing, or not, not, not even affiliate marketing, but 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 through actual legitimate sources, or, or, or having, or growing your or growing your uh, subscriber base, or anything like that. She just was giving it away. She's like, "Oh, actually, I know this people. If you're just starting off, this is a great company to work with, and this is how they're set up." I'm like, "What are you doing? It took you how long to get there?" Um, so to transition to that, what sort of resources or tools, or what or what sort of advice would you have for someone who's listening right now to say, "Hey, Kurt." 
I'm trying to be more persuasive. I don't necessarily want to go into closing techniques. You know, what can I do immediately or what or what can I do to make a big impact in terms of how persuasive I am? What what's going to have the quickest uh, return on investment in terms of time? What well, what would you say? Well, the one we mentioned before is is learning how to sell people how they want to be sold, you know, getting more tools. Okay. And one of the tools that we need to think about and talk about is and this was a bio opener for me as I spent all these years studying sales and persuasion and influence is that up to 95% of influence involves a subconscious trigger, you know, that emotional side of the sale. And that feeling could be, I, I like them. I don't like them. I trust them. I don't trust them. I mean, if you meet somebody on the street for the first time or they come into someone's office for the first time, it's 30 seconds before they've truly liked, they've decided if they like you or trust you. And the research shows it could be a variety of things that people don't even think about, from smell. When people are near the smell of a Cinnabon store, they're more likely to donate to a charity. It could be proxemics or how close you stand to the person or how you how you sit across from the person. It could I'm be going a gesture. To Cinnabon before I see customers. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Cinnabon? So, yeah, that's right. That's awesome. So <laughs> that's a big one. I mean, all these things come to play from the words you use to your gestures to the color of your clothes. Blues are more credible colors than other colors, and people don't realize that all this comes into play. They think they can vomit the 14 reasons they should do it, and they'll get all these features, and they'll assign a benefit to it, and that rarely works because you've given them two or three reasons not to do it. You've got to take a deep dive into human nature. and In fact, we've learned more about the brain in the last 10 years and the last 100 years combined, and these subconscious triggers are the root to selling. And if you don't understand those – if you don't understand the gestures, the words you're using, all these things, it's going to really hurt you. So that's where I would focus is understanding the emotional side of selling, those subconscious triggers, and that will make a big difference in your ability to sell. Okay. And you, and you said selling people how they want to be sold. What sort of tools or what sort of resources are available? How do you actually figure that Because if you're just – you know, in, in in most, and we like a lot of our listeners are are, are definitely business to business sales because there's definitely a lot of resources out there for on on the retail side. But a lot of ours are they're just entrepreneurs or they're maybe selling an intangible product. Um, they might be going to a client and they're just going through the classic sales model where they're, you know, I'm cold calling or might maybe maybe I'm fortunate fortunate enough that I have an appointment setter for me. I'm meeting this person for the first time. Maybe I looked them up on LinkedIn. I, I should think that if you're listening to this podcast, you're looking people up on LinkedIn, you're Googling them. So I was I was very surprised. Uh, or not, I wasn't surprised, but 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 Sherry says, oh, Kurt, you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah I've, 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 I Google him. I've, 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 I've seen his name before. Yeah, absolutely. How much time do you spend or how do you figure that out how someone wants to be sold or how or not wants or how someone's going to be persuaded? How do you figure that out? There's a variety of ways, obviously. If you have an appointment setter, hopefully you can have a list of questions or things they can check off. They can get a kind of a feel for their personality, their style. You mentioned LinkedIn. You can learn a lot about the person through LinkedIn or, or Facebook, some different things. Maybe you can talk to people that have worked with them before. But you, even if you've never had any contact with them, you can pick up different things throughout the conversation as you talk to them or even listening to their voicemail. It's amazing that you could understand. I mean, if someone – you hear this, it's Bob, you know the drill – Okay, that's a different personality than when you hear music in the background. Hey, it's Sally. Your call's important to me. <laughs> okay, so even through voicemail, little things that you pick up here and there can make a big difference. Even the initial conversation. The challenge is for most people is that they're so stuck on their script and what they need to say and what they need to vomit on them that they're not picking up on these little cues that helps helps them adapt their presentation, their style, their questions, knowing when to stop and to back up. If we just take the time to do maybe a little research and be more perceptive over the phone or face to face. That makes a big difference in your ability to adapt your style to them. How much? How much of selling are the companies you're dealing with right now have transitioned to having? I like to call them foot soldiers, having outside salespeople versus having an inside sales department and relying on that. And how much? Not necessarily harder, but how much of a difference is there between an outside salesperson and an inside salesperson? Ah, you know, I don't know the exact percentage for you, but I'd say maybe 30%, maybe a third. And, uh, you know, it's nice to outsource and have somebody else do it, someone else set the appointment. But the biggest challenge you're going to have, of course, is the training and the turnover. But even bigger than that is, is this person passionate about your product? Do they really believe in what you're doing? No, I'm not not even talking about 
about outsourcing. I'm just talking about like having either people who only sell on the phone and online versus people actually knocking on doors, going to see customers, flying. Oh, as far as separating those? Yes. Yeah, it's starting to happen. I, I, I guess with the people that I've worked, maybe 20%, but it's amazing. Some people are really good on the phone but not face-to-face. Some people are good face-to-face not on the phone, and, you, and you're right. Some people can do it all when mm-hmm. they have all the skills, but – you know, some people are just gold on the phone. They know what they're doing, and some people just need to see the face. They need the interaction. It's part of their personality, and so there is definitely a shift there. So when when you're giving a um, a seminar or, or whenever you're speaking to a company, then are you mainly you said eighty twenty or uh, I, I didn't get the figure down, and we can we can clean that up in post. Um, how much? How much is outside? How much is inside sales? Are you focusing on some more outside sales skills, or are you just saying it's pretty much universal? You can tell from tone. You can tell from, from, from all the research. Yeah, it's universal. I it's definitely universal. think it's universal. Yeah. Okay, so you don't have any sort of special tool, someone that might be. I mean, aside from maybe if you're an outside, I think sometimes outside outside salespeople have a little bit better advantage because they can gather intel in terms of posture and body language. You can go and you can see, and I I recommend this as well. You can see the sign-in book and see how many of your competitors have been there. You can see who they've actually asked for. Uh, so you might see some other decision makers, and you might have some additional tools that might be face to face. But then again, that person that actually is inside, you know, you can be anyone. Some people I know who are very good on the phone, just face to face. I don't know why they're just not they're just not as presentable. Um, uh, I think I think that's very very interesting. How just just the overall set of influence. It doesn't really matter what you're saying. If you learn the skills and you have the techniques, you can do it on the phone. You can do it face to face. You you don't have to be face to face to be a good influencer. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. It's it's easier for me, especially face to face. You're seeing them. You're working to the motion, the gestures. But the reality is, a, a true salesperson is probably going to do them all. If you're going to do the face to face first, then there's going to be some work over the phone. And some are doing everything over the phone, and that takes a special talent and skill to to connect over the phone and build the trust. But then they're more skilled on reading the the vocal inflections and understanding the person and asking the right questions. And so for most people and most sales, they're still doing all of it to where they might be Skyping, they might be doing a presentation, they might be doing a webinar, they're going to be doing things over the phone and then persuading via email. That's a whole other area that you need to focus on as far as learning how to persuade and influence. So people are specializing, but most salespeople are going to be selling through every medium. Gotcha. How much, now you also do this as well, so you also help people craft their messages, how they send the email, what kind of words they use, spacing, greeting. Do you go into that much detail, or you just kind of give, okay, here are some bullet points, and these are some things you want to focus on? No, I go into deep detail on that one, because it's what I call the law of verbal packaging that, Every word you use, especially in an email, but also in a presentation, will attract or repel the person. And a lot of salespeople are using words that they use every day so it doesn't phase them, but it repels the prospect. It, it triggers that subconscious triggers, that subconscious trigger, and the person just doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. Every word you matter. So we go through different words and word choice and what they can and can't use, what words are more persuasive than others, because it matters. And one thing I find interesting, and, and you probably have a little bit more data on this, how have has the word choices had to change because so many salespeople were already using those words? So instead of save money, everyone's saying save money. Now I have to say cut cost. Now I can't say cut cost anymore because everyone's saying cut cost. I have to say something different. How often are you finding people have to pivot and maybe use a different word because we've already got those 5,000 messages? Like, for example, um, talk about the old, the old school method. Hey, I'm just going to give you some free information. When I hear free information, I'm going back to the old model. I remember that. Oh, yeah, some free information. I'm going to hear a sales pitch. Mm-hmm. I mean, how how often are are you finding that, or are you not seeing that? Oh, you're seeing it, but it's accelerating. It used to be maybe every ten years. I mean, you saw a used car get changed to pre-owned, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just kind of how it is. And so I would say every couple of years. I mean, free used to be the word. Now that doesn't pull anymore. And it has to, just ab- have to absolutely free, absolutely free, as opposed to regular free, which I still don't <laughs> exactly. know the difference. Instead of mostly free, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and that's the thing. Things have changed, and it's accelerating because we're hitting with getting so many different messages that people have to cut through that clutter. And we hear the same phrases and word choices over over and over again. 
people don't realize you've got to look at every word and what your industry is using, what's repelling, what's attracting people, because if you don't, it's really going to hurt your presentation. Gotcha. In terms of presenting and stuff like that, too, and this is something I've I, I've had pushback in terms of the company I work for, and 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 he and he's and the owner he he's he's seen it my way now. Sometimes we'll get you know well you're spending too much time working on this account or working on this presentation. This is what our competitors doing, and they're able to get this kind of customer. Why don't why don't we do that? And I like to think that it's better to spend more time on an account that you know and cover all bases. I, I believe in building in redundancy. So when I, I we did another podcast on presenting. You're gonna assume the internet's not gonna work that day if you want to do a presentation. Have some sort of backup. So I, I bring an iPad. My iPad can be actually can be a mobile hotspot. Can, can be it can be a Wi-Fi spot. I can present on the iPad if I need to. I have printed versions. I have extra copies of any sort of proposals in case someone else is gonna be in the meeting. I always have extra business cards. I go. I definitely. I definitely go above and beyond. How much of persuasion do you think is just preparing for that and preparing for that initial meeting let's say we have a classic two-step model first meeting i'm just going to gather information second meeting i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to present an actual proposal oh you want a number i'd say 40 50 percent i mean you're prepared because that does a couple of things you're prepared for whatever they're throwing at you you're putting yourself in their shoes what's in it for them you've brought extra copies just in case and so you're thinking through it ahead of time instead of just showing up and giving the same presentation that you've given 20 times before you're adapting, you're customizing, you're thinking it through. So it not only helps a prospect, but it does something for your psyche, your mindset. I mean, the study shows that when you feel influential, you're more influential. And so when you're prepared, that reduces your fear. It come, you come across different with your prospect. You have the right information. So that is a huge piece of your ability to sell is being prepared. But then we get, you know, we get so busy, we, we just show up and just wing it, and that works maybe every once in a while. But for every minute you prepare, it's going to make a huge difference in your confidence, in your demeanor, in your ability to adapt to that person and sell them how they want to be sold. Now, I, I do I do want to ask that. So, you, so we talk about um, selling to different personality types, and we talk about the person who talks a lot. When you have a limited time, how 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 can you best do that? When you have someone who likes to talk a lot and who's very who's very very chatty, and you're getting off topic or in terms of the actual you need you need to gather information from from the actual person, or, or, or you need to see whether or not it's going to be a fit, or you need to get more information. How how do you politely, or how do you personally, pivot someone back onto the actual subject matter without coming across as, or do you just give less information at that point, or do you ask less questions if a person is just rambling on about a lot of different things? Well. If- they're in rambling phase. Some people, some personalities need to ramble. <laughs> okay. And sometimes it sells people like, I don't have time for this. I have time for this. But, you know, if you want that connection, that rapport, that trust, sometimes you've got to listen to it, you know, to a point. I mean, if it's after three hours, you obviously got to do something. But they need to talk. They need to talk about their family. And if you're building rapport and that connection is happening, this is a good thing, right? Again, we have to figure out how much time you want to invest in that. But then it comes to the point once you have that connection, you feel that you have that trust, we always have heard that questions control the conversation. And so when there's kind of a lull in that conversation, just asking a great question goes a long way. I mean, one of my favorite ones is, well, hey, that's interesting. Let me ask you a question. What does that perfect solution look like to you? Right? And just shut up and, and keep asking questions and get them to the point where they'll tell you everything you need to know to sell them. But, you know, there has a point there to where you have to cut them off. Again, if you're going hours just listening about their family and different things, there's a certain point there. But if you ever need control during a presentation, during anything, asking a question will give control back to you. That's that's that that's golden. Sales is asking good questions and I think persuasion and you and you're I, I would imagine you would agree. Persuasion is more about the kind of questions you ask and how you ask them and the quality of your questions. Mm-hmm. Because people can tell right away, and, and, and I've been spending a lot more time with my actual sales team on the quality of the questions and the actual tone and, the, and then how the mannerism comes across. Because sometimes if it sounds like you're being like, 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 you feel like the grand inquisitor, it's not going to work. You, you need to gather information from them, and you need to, you need to make them f- – they, and they need to feel that, that you are an expert. A lot of that comes in the, not only the quality of the questions but also how you ask the questions. Correct. 
Exactly. And my research shows if I've looked at top salespeople, they actually ask three times more questions. And you have to realize, too, that even if you know the answer to the question, you have to ask the question. And here's the example that I give. If you went to a doctor, you're feeling sick, and you talk to the nurse, and the doctor finally opens the door, doesn't walk in and says, I know what you have. I will go ahead and get you a prescription. I'll leave it at the front desk and shut the door. Okay, let's assume the doctor's 100% correct. The doctor's thinking good time management. The doctor's thinking I just solved their problem. The doctor's thinking they should be happy. But you, as the patient, you're saying, wait a minute, what's going on? You'd be offended. You you would, right? And that's what you need to do is to have to ask the right questions, to be the consultant, to come across as the expert. And again, when you're perceived as the expert, they'll answer as many questions as you want, just like the doctor. It's very rare for a doctor to ask too many questions. You want them to ask questions because you want them to solve your problem. Hmm. And yeah, I, I hear that a lot in terms of sales, and a lot of people do give a lot of people do give that analogy. Now, what about when you run into a situation? And uh, did you ever read the book called It's called The Challenger Sale? Oh, you bet. Uh huh. How do you best handle that? Where where someone thinks that, that they have a solution? And yours might be a slight spin on that, or maybe they came in asking for X, and you feel that product Y is going to be better for them. How do you how do you pivot, or how do you best persuade someone in that regard, where they've done the research, and you're kind of helping them see the light of maybe a different solution or something different than what they had in mind? Because a lot of people, you mentioned the actual doctor's appointment. Some people like that. Some people are like, I don't want to go to a doctor. He's going to write me a prescription. I already know. I already did the research and stuff like that. My mother, who's crazy, she's like that. She, if the doctor will go in, and, yeah, just write me a prescription for this. I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. This is what I have, she'll, and she'll go into it. Some people, some people are like that. Or, oh, I'll go online and I'll, I'll just order this right away. How do you help sell the the actual different package, or, or, or maybe where your solution is going to be different? So, for example, if you were to come in and you were to sell to my company, you know, I might say, okay, well, I'm going to want you to be a motivational speaker. I just want you to pump up my sales team. And you say, well, no, 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 no. I want to spend more time learning the process and learning about what you're doing, and, and here's why. How do you how do you make that pivot when you need to influence someone into a different product where they're kind of sold on you and they're sold on the company and they like you, but but your idea is different than what they had imagined? How do you how do you work that in? That's a great question. I mean, we've talked about your ability to ask questions and coming across as the expert. It needs to be done gradually for most people. Let me explain. There's a technique called FITD, which is foot in the door. Okay. That Let me just kind of explain it with a study. Everything I teach is based on science to where they went to psychology students at the university and said, hey, will you participate in a sensory perception study Saturday at 6 a.m.? Right? That's a pretty big ask. For a college kid? Got, yeah, college kids. Uh -huh. And they got 24% to say yes. Then they applied the foot in the door technique, and this is how simple it is. They said, hey, we're doing a study on sensory perception. Will you participate? Well, yeah. It's uh, Saturday. Are you available? Yeah. It's at 6 a.m. Will you be there? Can you be there? Went from 24% to 56%. Huh. Now, here's the important thing. When you're getting a lot of resistance, what you're asking is too big. If you look at your sales presentation – and you're getting a lot of resistance in a certain area, you need to take your question or, or your yes question and break it down to three, four, five, six different yes questions. And that's true with this type of thing that we're talking about. If you're getting a lot of resistance, you've got to slowly be, lead them down the path of getting the yeses, helping them realize for themselves that you're the expert, that they need to make the change. And, the only, and that's the key thing is a little bit at a time because if you ask for that big thing, they're going to resist because the moment you prove that they're wrong – they're going to resist you. The human brain needs to be right. And if you show them that they're wrong, even though they are wrong, they're not going to admit it, and that's where that resistance happens. And if you can break it down to smaller yeses, help them understand for themselves that you are the perfect solution, even though they had a good solution too, that makes the biggest difference to be able to, to crack that code. So so your philosophy is more of the and, – and, and, and I personally, I, I've used both sometimes – where you go and you go in for a bunch of small ask and eventually go to you eventually go to a big ask. So let's say you're in, you're in a uh, business to business environment and basically what you're doing you can either get them to commit to all your services at once or to, or to go ahead and do and do the smaller services. Is your overall plan to say all right I'm going to ask for the smaller one and build up or I'm going to ask for the bigger one knowing I'm going to need to go back to the smaller one? Do you kind of feel that out in terms of resistance? 
Yeah, filled out with resistance, and it's always good to get that small initial order, even though it's not a lot of money, just to get that foot in the door to get things going to, to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, you always want to get the yes unless you're trying to adjust the perception of value. You know, the knee-jerk reaction, it's too expensive. Then you would use a different approach. It's actually called door-in-the-face approach where you do want to get the no just to adjust the perception of the, of the value of what you're working with. Hmm. Meaning, let me give you an example. They went to uh, get to students. They would say, hey, will you do a two-minute survey? And 25% said yes. Now, the door-in-the-face, you're adjusting the perception of time, value, energy, money. They said, hey, will you do a two-hour survey? Well, no, I can't do that. Will you at least do a two-minute survey? It went from 25% to 50%. So sometimes you want to, if you're adjusting the perception of the value of your product or your service, you can come with that approach. But usually if you want to persuade them a little bit at a time, get their business, foot in the door, it's much easier to get compliance that way with the foot in the door technique unless you're trying to adjust the perception of value or time. Okay, good. Now, and and, and, then, and, then, and then we'll kind of wrap things up a little bit. So... I talked. We talked about different learning styles: visual, auditory, kinesthetic. You're definitely auditory. Or I like to think you are, and, you, and, you may, and maybe you're agreeing with me. Maybe I'm just really, really persuasive. I'm just telling you. Um, <laughs> but I can, I can kind of guess by the way you talk and, and how you carry yourself that you're more an auditory. I'm definitely more auditory. Like if I read audio books or not read, if I listen to audio books, I actually process things a little bit better. I'm listening more things in the car. And I talk about how sometimes I call kinesthetic people weirdos. How do you best sell maybe to that type, that personality type that's maybe a little bit more pensive or maybe the person where you're not getting as much feedback or maybe where it's, you know, it's just harder to, to build rapport where you just have that, hey, it's Bob, you know what to do. And, you know, you, you're trying to get commitment and you're trying to get those little yeses and you're not getting that. How do you how do you sell to those kind of people? How do you persuade those people? Is there a magic bullet? How do you, how do you do it? Well, the magic bullet is realizing that they're different. You know, you mentioned weirdos, and you have to realize <laughs> that you're a weirdo to them, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and, and then once we realize that we're all weird, and it's we just have to adapt. In fact, in the seminar setting, I say, okay, well, let's talk about different personalities. What is the best type of personality to have? People kind of look at each other. They get all sheepish because they all think theirs is the best. (laughs) And I say, I'm okay with that, but you have to adapt. And so the magic bullet is realizing, you know, something's wrong here. I'm not connecting because you're, if you're not a toy person, you present how you like to be presented to. And so you're, you're geared to presenting to an auditory person. And so you have to realize, okay, they're kinesthetic. Let's get the whiteboard out. Let's draw it out. Let's map it out for you. Even though that's not your style, they're going to need to, get on the whiteboard and, and map it out or see a visual presentation like PowerPoint versus the auditory person just needs to, to hear it and talk it through and versus the, the kinesthetic person, you're right. These are tight to take it apart. How does it work? How does this do All right? Adapting to those different styles is important, but the magic bullet is realizing, okay, you're different, which is okay. But then when that connection's not there, are they auditory, are they visual, are they kinesthetic, what is their personality and adapt and sell them how they want to be sold. So do you, when you talk about different uh, persuasion styles and stuff like that, do you, do you go with the normal VAC, V-A-K, or do you go even further? And, you know, you, Brian Tracy has some different models. You have the thinker. You have the, you have the knee-jerk people. Do you have uh, a, a set way that, that, that you're going to – and, again, people can be a little bit of, of everything. Do you have a set um, – internal like plan where you say okay well this person is a type a person this is a type b this is this is a c person where you go and you actually persuade it or do you just follow the normal vak i kind of extend it a little bit because when you go into personalities you could go into well, there's 32 different types of personalities 32 to anybody, yeah to anybody it's like whoa blow your brain your brain your brain blows up right it's too many mm-hmm. and so i say I mean, if you studied NLP, there's the meta programs, you know, visual, auditory, kinesthetic is a meta program. So what I try to teach is let's get used to one and how to adapt and let's add another one. So once you learn visual, auditory, kinesthetic, you could take a look, okay, are the introverts or the extroverts? Okay, are they assertive or are they amiable? Okay, are they motivated by inspiration or desperation? Okay, and so as you grow in the process, I think it's easier for most salespeople, okay, let's work on this one, this one meta program first, and that's meta programs, how you see the world. And we all see the world a little bit differently. All right, once you've mastered that, okay, now are they more introvert or introvert, extroverted? 
and you could add some different elements to the style because to most people personalities is can be very overwhelming when you look at how many of the different types of personalities and the reactions to different things pick one and visual auditory kinesthetic is a great place to start and then start adding some of these other ones then it becomes natural to you you don't have to think about it every time you try to sell somebody hmm. and and in terms of and i say jokingly in terms of the weirdo so for me personally when it when in for, for my company pretty much what what we do is it, it's mainly service-based i mean we do have we do have software we do have we do have some systems in place and one of my sales reps actually asked me because we when we when we show the software, depending on who the person is, uh, if someone is kinesthetic, I will I won't even show this I won't even show the system like normally like you demo say hey this is how you do this and this is how you find this and you're really gonna like this and you're really excited about it. When I run into a kinesthetic person, I'll actually let them in the driver's seat and I'll let them play around with it a little bit and I might ask a question. So okay, how? So let me ask you now for your process. How do you do this? So if you're on my website, I mean, do you think do you, do you see yourself being able to do that? Can you get what you need to do easily? And that works out a lot better. I think just you talk about changing how you present. And my sales he said, "Well, how come you didn't show it? How can you let him?" And I'm like, "Because that's how that person is. Mm -hmm. He wants to take it apart. If I were to tell him how to do things, as much as I can paint a visual picture, as much as I can be enthusiastic, oh, you're really going to like this, or this is going to be great. You need to be able to adapt." Um, and one thing uh, we definitely got a lot of we definitely got a lot of uh, great information. I do want to do a uh, quick uh, plug, and we do it in the beginning, and we, and we change this up. And maybe I'll ask you this too: um, when you have, for example, a sponsor, we, we've actually played around with that a little bit. We've mentioned the sponsor in the beginning of a message, we mentioned the middle, and at the end. Is there a best practice for that if you're trying to persuade someone where you do want to pitch something? Well, usually it has to be the beginning or the end. Beginning or end, not in the middle. Yeah, middle, everything gets lost in the middle. It's uh, the primary recency effect to where it's the beginning and the end we remember the most. And, and it's usually at the end where you're asking them to do what you want them to do or to remember those things. If I was to choose one, it would be absolutely at the end. Absolutely at the end. Great. So we're going to transition into that. Um, our, our sponsor for today's uh, podcast, it's actually it's going to be Blinkist. Uh, again, I personally, I love Blinkist. And 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 what what they actually do is they take whole – whole books and they narrow it down into 15 20 minute reads of what actually is valuable in that book or they make it very very digestible so someone who loves reading and you might say well hey i read a 300 page sales book but i only got two ideas they actually funnel out some of the actual ideas so if you go to pushpullsales.com slash quick read you can go up there and you can sign up for a free trial or if you want you can just sign up for the thing so for me when i saw it I just clicked right away. I'm like, I'm definitely going to do this. And, I, and you're able to read so many books in a short period of time. To transition into that, I think you have some great resources. I checked out your website, um, looked at, uh, looked at it, just looked at your podcast just now. Um, where can people find you, Kurt? A couple of places. The podcast is at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. Okay. And uh, my, uh, if you want more about me and uh, actually if you want to take a Persuasion IQ test, you can go to AdvancedInfluence.com. And, it, it, and is it is it absolutely free or kind of free? <laughs> Mostly free. Mostly <laughs> free. <laughs> no, it's absolutely free if you want to take your persuasion IQ test. You see, you kind of rank in the world of persuasion and influence. And if you're really hardcore, want to get into it, check out our 52 week program at influenceuniversity.com, where we take a deep dive and and get you more tools. If that's my main message, is get more tools. And you said that earlier. You said you have over 100 different tools. Mm-hmm. 100 different tools, and what were there 12 of? There was 12. 12 laws of persuasion. 12, oh, there's only 12? Well, all the, have more than 12, have the 12 a, laws. Okay. There's 12 main laws that you need to, to understand to really work with people both on the emotional side and the logical side. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you so you have in terms of – so not only are you doing face-to-face, uh, -face, you're going out to businesses, presenting, presenting all around the world, doing the podcast. You have an online resource where someone – at any time, can go in. So let's say you have a sales rep. He's working. He's knocking on doors all day. You know, at the end of the day or on the weekend, he can go and he can check out your website and he can learn on at his own pace and and and, and on his own time. Correct. Correct. How long did it take you to to actually to develop that and put that in place? Well, the website took a couple of years, but I mean, as far as the content, that took probably fifteen years. I mean, there's. Hundreds of videos, hundreds of audios, 
great resources to help people out. There's over a thousand different articles, and it's built in two ways to where you can learn it step by step. But some people, especially salespeople, don't no, teach me how to do this one, and you can search it and find it and, and quickly solve that challenge that you're having. So you also have quick resources. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. I I love that as a, as a sales manager. I love that. I love that as a salesperson. Any sort of resource where I can do things on my on my own time or where I can point my sales reps or where I can point my sales team, I'll definitely do that. In terms of the influence IQ, let me ask you, how many times do you see aliases coming through where someone doesn't want to put their actual name? <laughs> so if you go to a business and you tell them that, hey, you can go online and they just might put like Bob Vila or something like that, where, where, where someone, you might be a little bit embarrassed. Oh, actually, I'm not as persuasive as I thought. <laughs> a lot. Really? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people there just right, just trying to see what's going on, what's happening, and you know we could all approve in the world of persuasion and influence, but mostly salespeople, especially salespeople, think they're doing better than they actually are, especially in the world of trust. Well, they trust me. It's interesting as I do these intercepts, I'll I'll talk to the salesperson. Did you build trust? And nine out of ten times they'll say yes, and I'll talk to the prospect, and only one out of time, only one out of ten times was there trust. <laughs> So there's a disconnect between where we think we are and where we really are, and, and that's a big challenge for salespeople. Cool. All right. Thank you again, Kurt. We definitely uh, we definitely appreciate having you on the uh, podcast today. We're going to have links to all the resources that you talked about today. We're going to have links to your website. Uh, definitely going to put a link to the Influence IQ. Last thing, do you have any final words? Do you have anything for our listeners? Yeah, you know, I was very passionate about persuasion and sales, and there's a direct correlation between your ability to sell and your income and your personal development. I just want to put it to you this way: there's there's two ways to double your sales, double your income. You can work twice as hard, twice as many dials, twice as many presentation, or you can double your sales skills, double the amount of tools that you're using. Get more tools, persuade people how they want to be persuaded. It'll make such a huge difference in every aspect of your life. We all sell for a living as parent, teachers, leaders, managers master these skills, increase your income. It'll make a huge difference in your ability to sell and the success that you're having. Awesome. Thanks again, Kurt. Great stuff. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.